Welcome everyone. I am Seema Wadwa, the Executive Director of Environmental Stewardship at Kaiser Permanente, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the event today, Getting to Net Zero, the Health Equity Imperative. We are proud to host this discussion with the national climate and health leaders and discuss why getting to net zero can improve health and address disparities. I'm pleased to also introduce Kaiser Permanente's Senior Vice President and Chief Health Officer, Dr. Bashara Kosher. Dr. Kosher leads our organization's efforts to address the social health of all of our members and communities we serve. This work includes the creation of the nation's largest social health network integrated with Kaiser Permanente's health care services to meet the housing, food, and transportation needs of our members. He is also responsible for the organization's environmental stewardship work leading to Kaiser Permanente becoming carbon neutral in 2020. From January through November 2021, Dr. Kusher served as a White House National Vaccination Coordinator where he focused on coordinating the timely, safe, and equitable administration of COVID-19 vaccination for the U.S. population. Dr. Kusher, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Seema, and it's uh, great to be with you all. Um, there is no doubt that climate change impacts health. And there is no doubt that climate change disproportionately impact health, particularly communities of color, low-income communities, and particularly uh, communities who have been disadvantaged over the years. And as an organization, Kaiser Permanente is committed to health equity. And as an integral part of us advancing health equity is our commitment to being good stewards of the environment. And this is exactly why over the years we've been on this journey and we became the first health system uh, in the US to be certified carbon neutral back in 2020. And that was with focus on scopes one and two. And this is why yesterday we've made the commitment to double down on our decarbonization journey and we're making a commitment to reduce our carbon emission by 50% by 2030, and we are aiming to become net zero by 2050. And we're signing on to the Health and Human Services Pledge. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be here today with Admiral Rachel Levine. Admiral Levine is the Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, she oversees a slew of offices, including the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Admiral Levine, I am so excited to have you here with us today. So welcome to Kaiser Permanente. Thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be here. Well, um, last time we both were uh, together on a live uh, event, it was uh, when I served as the White House vaccination coordinator and the two of us held a national town hall talking to pediatricians and family physicians with the AAP and the AAFP to encourage physicians to talk to their patients about vaccinations. So it, it's been many months from now, so thank you for all what uh, you have done and you continue to do to help us put this pandemic behind us. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for your work as for leading the uh, vaccination campaign for the country um, over that past year. Uh, absolutely fantastic work and uh, working to distribute and administer our safe and effective vaccines to help our country get past COVID-19. Well, I'm incredibly proud of how the federal government, state government, local government, health systems, not-for-profit, all of us rolled up our sleeve and got this country vaccinated. So I'm incredibly proud of that. But today we're lifting up this really important moment and we couldn't think of a better partner to celebrate our commitment with today than you and the work that you're leading at HHS. So maybe we'll start by sharing with us what is this HHS pledge all about? So just share with us and with the audience here today. Thank you so much. So we know that uh, climate change has significant health impacts. And I love the term that you're using at Kaiser of environmental stewardship. I think that that hits the mark exactly. And so we need to all work together to make sure that our health systems are resilient to the impacts of climate change and also that they work to decarbonize. And so the pledge that we're asking people to, uh, to make, the health hospitals and health systems to make, is that they will do that, exactly that. They'll become resilient to the impacts of climate change and they'll work um, with the metrics that you discussed 
um, in terms of decarbonizing their hospitals and health systems. Uh, and then we're going to have an event uh, uh, currently scheduled at the, uh, at the end of June uh, to be able to go to the White House and to uh, celebrate hospitals and health systems making that pledge um, at the White House. And then the work begins to actually accomplish that. And you all have gone, uh, uh, you know, the extra mile and accomplished uh, much of what we need to do already by in 2020. Well, the, so that uh, brings me to the next question. So once that pledge is signed on and people and health system signed on, what would come next? Like, how's that work going to evolve over the next few years to get us there? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are currently part of a, uh, a collaborative uh, for the National Academy of Medicine. I know you all are involved as well. And so that is bringing together many, many private sector partners to be able to, to work on that. And the National Academy uh, of Medicine Collaborative, under the leadership of Dr. Victor Zhao, will be providing a lot of expertise and technical assistance to hospitals and health systems to actually accomplish what they've pledged to do. In addition, our new office, which was mentioned of climate change and health equity, will really marshal much of the resources of the federal government to provide that assistance as well. Well, that's, I'm glad you've mentioned the, the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. We're really excited about this office. You want to share with us a little bit more about the office and what you expect from this office? Absolutely. So under uh, Secretary Becerra's leadership in the fall of 2021, we started this new office of climate change and health equity. And it is to look at the health impacts of climate change that we've been discussing, but with that health equity lens, because we know that those communities that have historically historically suffered health disparities are also suffering significant health challenges uh, from the impacts of climate change, including heat, including forest fires, um, smoke from those fires, um, uh, uh, sea level rise, and more. Yeah, and we have been seeing this every single day. It's not just this is something to think about down the future. It's just happening today. I mean, you think about the heat waves, the fires, the climate impact. It's just a, we really need to be prepared. So thank you for bringing the expertise and the leveraging the resources from the federal government to help us, help us with that. And in addition to the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, there was a new office that also you've announced around environmental justice. So talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So that office was started actually in the last two weeks. And so our Office of Environmental Justice is located within our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, or OCHI, as we affectionately call it. And so this office will be looking at, th at those health disparities broadly about uh, in terms of environmental issues. So it might involve climate change issues or um, problems from climate change, but other issues as well. For example, um, in several days, I'll be going to, uh, to Los Angeles and, and going to uh, an area that, uh, of a school um, that is located near uh, a, a metal factory that shreds metal. And th They've had significant environmental issues for, for decades now because of that. It also is on, I gather, what is called the Almeda Corridors, where there's tremendous traffic, and that has caused significant um, air pollution uh, for that area and the children that are at that school. Um, previously to this position, I was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania, uh, and we dealt with significant um, lead poisoning issues in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has some of the oldest housing stock in the nation, uh, concerns about still about lead paint, and that again uh, hits those same disadvantaged communities. So we're going to be looking at environmental challenges such as that. So how do you anticipate that this office would identify these communities, what kind of resources you'd be able to bring to these communities or engage with these communities, lift up the assets in those communities? How do you envision this work to, to play out? Sure. So we actually do know who, where many of those communities are. So the communities in Pennsylvania, I mentioned uh, where I'm going in Los Angeles. Um, you know, yeah, we've been to some states in the south that are having challenges because of sea level rise um, with, uh, with sewage contaminating their, their water supply and the water table. Um, and so um, and that so that's one of the climate change issues as well. And so we know where many of these issues are, so we want to engage local and state health departments. And then we want to bring all the resources of the federal government to bear, uh, working with partners across HHS. That might include the CDC, the NIH, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and others, as well as other departments, such as the EPA, Department of Transportation um, as well, to be able to, again, help these communities that have suffered health disparities from these environmental impacts.
Great, thank you. And you've been on the West Coast now for a few days. Um, you've been visiting many of these communities. Looks like you are gonna be visiting some additional communities um, in the next couple of days. What have you been learning? What have you been hearing from community partners and, and folks in the community about climate change? Sure, so I, was, I had the pleasure to visit uh, Google yesterday and to meet with one of my predecessors, Dr. Karen DeSalvo, um, at Google um, to talk about these issues of climate change and health equity and how we can have a public-private partnership with Google and potentially with other tech firms. Um, I was able to visit San Jose yesterday and to meet with the mayor, uh, who has, is working to decarbonize San Jose, which, of course, one of the biggest cities in the country, and a, uh, an opportunity to do that. So, uh, And then with uh, state health department members today uh, to, to talk about their efforts and their Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. You know, on the road trips I've done over the last month or so, I've been to Seattle, I've been to New York City, I've been to Albuquerque, I've been to this area, and they are all suffering from these health impacts from climate change. It's not an existential threat in the future. The communities are suffering those impacts now, for example, with severe heat issues that they experienced last summer and that we're worried about experiencing this summer. And again, it hits those disadvantaged communities the hardest. Yeah, and we've seen that even within our own hospital systems with fires and the need to evacuate mm -hmm. and, and uh, to evacuate patients safely and do that very quickly. I mean, it's just uh, uh, those are real, real challenges that we've been seeing every single day. I, I think for a lot of people, they think climate change is something you need to be thinking about down the line, but the reality is we're thinking about this and we're feeling it every single day. That's exactly so, right. So is your sense that you're hearing the same stories across the country as you're visiting different parts of the country? It is. I, I think that there are some local variations, but again, I was really struck by the fact that from Seattle to New York to Albuquerque to California, um, in, severe heat is an issue. And of course, if you live in a community and you have means and you have air conditioning, you're going to be less impacted. If you're in a heat island and you have no ability to, to, to cool off, then uh, you're going to be more severely impacted. Um, other more coastal communities, of course, are seeing impacts from rising sea level um, uh, issues. And so all there is consistent themes that we're hearing, and that's what we want to do with our Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, to, to gather that information, to gather that data, work across our department and other departments to work to address the impacts on health of climate change. Yeah, and I think I, I um, love the fact how clearly you're articulating the connection between climate change and health equity. And I think we have no doubt that the impact of climate change is going to be disproportionate and it is going to impact communities of color, low income communities, communities that are most vulnerable. What advice do you have for health systems as they think about their role um, in addressing climate change? Well, I think that the, the health sector overall has a very important role to play. Uh, one is that the health sector accounts in the United States for 8.5 percent of our nation's carbon emissions. And so we're not going to be able to achieve President Biden's goals by 2030 without involving the health sector. I think we need to work at all levels, you, you, you know, all stages in terms of that, um, in, in terms of the decarbonization. I think the tough this one is going to be the supply chain. Uh, that is where, quote unquote, the rubber hits the road, both literally and figuratively. And so uh, we're going to be gaining uh, uh, marshalling expertise from across the administration to help those hospitals and health systems working with the National Academy of Medicine to achieve those goals. I think, thank you for bringing up the, the supply chain. We've been on a journey um, on with our suppliers and, and the supply chain leaders within Kaiser Permanente, and we had a chance to huddle earlier before we started this, uh, this life event with some of our leaders within Kaiser Permanente who are working on supply chain issues. And as you said, this is gonna be a journey I don't think we know exactly how it's going to play out between now and 2050, but I'm so glad to see so many health systems and, and, and others across the country, including the administration, focusing on how we decarbonize our supply chain and what would that look like. It's, it's a big chunk of our 
um, carbon comes from the supply chain and we have to come to it as a country and honestly as a globe to be able to make a difference there. This is a global issue. So uh, I was very <laughs> pleased to represent the Secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services at COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. And that is where the United States formally signed on to the COP26 health program, which commits the United States to those exact um, commitments um, uh, that we talked about, the building resilience to the impacts of climate change in our health systems, and also uh, working to decarbonize. The president's um, um, uh, memorandum uh, stated that we're going to do this in the federal government. That includes the VA. That includes the Department of Defense. That includes the Indian Health Service. And now we need to work with a public-private partnership to accomplish this across our nation. Thank you. And, and you've mentioned the National Academies of Medicine, and we're obviously a, um, a proud partner and sponsor of the collaborative that's happening there. Can you tell us a little bit about um, um, how you think this collaborative is going to continue to play out with health system? Well, I think that the collaborative under Dr. Victor Zhao's leadership for the National Academy of Medicine is a critical partner and has a critical role in this effort. Uh, because I think with, with the uh, stature of the National Academy of Medicine and Dr. Zhao, we can bring together many, many partners across uh, across the health sector, not only hospitals and health systems, but tech, uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies, the, the many of those supply chain companies, um, all working together to accomplish our goals, which are really absolutely essential for the health of our nation moving forward. Thank you, and, and we're um, obviously very proud to be part of that effort. We continue to engage and participate and bring our learnings and also come with a lot of humility to learn from others uh, throughout this journey. The other aspect that we're also focusing on as we start thinking our journey to scope three is really our investment portfolio and thinking about how we invest in a way that's um, help us towards that journey to to net zero. Any thoughts or comments you have on that space? Well, you know, I, I think that uh, the president has articulated and, and throughout the, the administration, our secretaries have talked about, is that we have to do all this in, in a fiscally responsible way. Um, and we have to do it actually that creates jobs and that helps our economy um, as we achieve um, uh, carbon neutrality across the, across our nation. And so I think that that, um, that is going to be essential. We have to do this in a way that actually helps the finances of of, the, of our great health systems and other companies, and that helps the, the economy of our nation. Thank you. And a uh, couple more questions before sure. we wrap up. We have a, an amazing panel right after our fireside chat that are ready to kind of take this discussion to the next level and talk about more about this intersection between climate health and uh, climate change and, and um, health equity. Just a couple of questions. You know, you've talked, you got a chance to um, to meet across the country lots of physicians who are interested in climate change and what role they can play. We, in the huddle earlier today, you got a chance to meet uh, um, Dr. Rita Neg, our uh, physician in chief here in, in Oakland, who show, shared with you how many of our physicians are so passionate and excited about playing a role in that space. What advice or comments do you have for physicians across the country? And we're both physicians here who are very passionate um, about this space? Well, I think it is in, in very important for a physician, physician leaders, but other m medical professions as well, to be invested in this. And that's why I love your term of, of, of environmental stewardship. We all really are stewards as healthcare professionals of our nation's health. And um, the health impacts of climate change is really going to be one of the greatest challenges that we face um, in the 21st century. So I think it really needs all of us working together. It's going to be critical critically important for physicians uh, to, be, uh, to be educated and informed about this, and then to work within their hospitals, within their health systems, with local state health departments to accomplish our goals. Absolutely. Um, and my final question uh, to you, um, Admiral Levine, you oversee many offices, and health equity is integral to a lot of the work that you do day in and day out. Climate change is obviously an important uh, part of that journey towards health equity. What final comments do you have about this journey as a country towards helping us achieve health equity? Well, he health equity is really fundamental to everything that we're working on at the Department of Health and Human Services. It is absolutely critical uh, and one of the top priorities for Secretary Becerra. And so we don't want to make it just one more thing we're working on. We're working on COVID, we're working on mental health, and then we work on health equity. Health equity actually is, is the foundation of all of the topics that we're working on, whether it is 
COVID-19, uh, long COVID, which my office is working on, whether it's mental health, whether it's overdoses, um, whether it's the impacts of climate change, health equity is a fundamental principle for all of those, and we have to embed it into all the work that we're doing. And this is exactly how we look at our contribution as an organization towards this journey to health equity. I think our commitment to addressing the impact of uh, climate change is one part of that, but it truly is looking at all of the things that we do within our organization, within the, for all the things that we do for our 200,000 plus colleagues, 22,000 plus physicians, to the 12 and a half million members that we um, support and depend on us for their uh, care and coverage. To the 68 million people in our communities, we are committed to continue to be on this health equity journal uh, journey. Uh, Admiral Levine, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for um, sharing this time with us here at Kaiser Permanente today. Thank you for your uh, leadership on uh, climate change. Thank you for your leadership at the Health and Human Services Department. Thank you for all what you've done uh, to help us put this pandemic behind us. We're so thrilled you're here. And now we'll turn it over to Seema to get us to the next part of this panel. Thank you, Admiral Levine and Dr. Shukair for that inspiring discussion. I am so excited about all of this work and the possibilities ahead. I am honored to introduce our amazing panel of climate and health leaders for our next discussion. Here with us today is Dr. Don Berwick, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, an organization he co-founded and led as President and CEO for 19 years. He is one of the nation's leading authorities on healthcare quality and improvement. Dr. Berwick also previously held the position of Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. He is a pediatrician by background and has served as a clinical and public health professor, as well as served on numerous healthcare and quality improvement boards and committees. He is currently serving on the steering committee of the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on Decarbonization of the, health, of the U.S. health sector. We're also joined by Dr. Colin Cave, a head and neck surgeon and the medical director of external affairs, government relations and community health for Northwest Permanente. He also previously, previously served as a chairman of the board for the medical group. Colin heads up Northwest Medical Group's regional and national leadership efforts in addressing climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and enacting their own climate action plan. In addition, he serves on the board of Oregon for Climate Action. We are also thrilled to have Mishka Mitchell, president and CEO of Emerald Cities Collaborative, complete our panel. She leads a national nonprofit network of organizations working to advance sustainable environments while creating sustainable, just, and inclusive economies. She has over 18 years of leadership experience in climate justice and equitable and inclusive neighborhood development. Before joining Emerald Cities, Mishka served as Vice President of Camden Community Partnerships, a nonprofit community and economic development organization in her hometown of Camden, New Jersey. Thank you all so much for joining us today. So I'd really like to start by asking each of you for a quick reflection on Admiral Levine's comments. Having HHS involved in addressing health impacts of climate change is truly a momentum shift for this work. So I'd love to get your reactions on what spoke to you about this, uh, this conversation. And let's turn it to uh, Dr. Don Berwick first. Well, thank you so much, uh, Seema. It's a delight to be with you and with uh, Colin and Mishka as well. Uh, well, a lot of uh, things about Admiral Levine's comments impressed me. The, the biggest thing, though, is, is, is the fact of high-level federal focus on this problem. Uh, there are a tremendous number of issues competing for attention in the public arena and in the private sector and in healthcare. And to have the Assistant Secretary for Health step forward as she has in, with the support of the Secretary and the President in such a forceful way is, is an extremely important resource for getting action going on this. Um, you have to have some empathy today for the um, many demands that are being made both on clinicians and on executives and leaders in American healthcare. And they need signals. They need leaders to step forward like Admiral Levine has and say, this is important. We need to do it. Uh, that's going to help give us momentum. And the establishment of the new office is, is a structural step in that direction. The other thing that really impresses me is the learning system that's now being established. And I must credit uh, Admiral Levine with her leadership there. She has shown up repeatedly in the National County of Medicine context, in which I'm on a steering committee, as you said, Seema. Uh, she's present. She, she participates. 
and she's encouraging the kind of learning all together that this is going to need. Uh, this is not a problem for silos. This is a problem for collaborative action. And the model of interaction between the federal government and the private sector that we're seeing uh, under the aegis of that collaborative and with Admiral Levine's support is, is really thrilling. So there's a lot of promise here. Great. And let's, let's uh, uh, Mishka, it'd be great to get your reactions next. Sure. Thank you, Seema. Um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to be here today. Certainly, um, I am thrilled and you know very enthusiastic just to hear Admiral Levine's uh, talking points today. Um, you know, I echo um, you know the sentiments about thinking how this federal response really is different in creating this structural change to think about how you know health equity and climate justice really are more than just buzzwords, and you know really taking it from something that you know has you know, been in the framework for, for many, many years, but being able to put those federal resources behind it in order to have sustained action. Um, you know, we are all right that in order to tackle this climate crisis, it, it's gonna take an innovative thinking and innovative ways and you know, collaborative ways to come together to really be able to tackle this in a different way. And so, the you know the climate change and health equity office and then you know a subs a, a different office around environmental justice really helps to put that framework together um, as the first step to really think about how to tackle this um, as a comprehensive problem. Thank you. Those are definitely really important reflections. Uh, you know, one of the other things I'd love to delve a little deeper into is you know we've had many heard from many people that climate change disproportionately impacts and is a health equity issue. So Mishka, from your perspective, um, and actually be, uh, before we shift to this question, uh, Dr. Cave, I realized we didn't give you an opportunity to share your reaction. So please, let's hear from you first. I appreciate that because I'm very excited about this. Um, you know, there have been a lot of people that have been leading in this space but there surprisingly are still so many who are on the sidelines. Um, with some notable exceptions, the physician and clinician community has been one of those groups on the sidelines for too long. So by the Admiral uh, and her department giving voice to this, we're now normalizing, not just the fact that, you know, there's global warming and climate change, but we're normalizing the fact that this has a great effect on, on all populations with disproportionate effect on populations of color. Um, the other great thing about this is that uh, when one branch of government sees what another branch of government is doing, it elevates it to everybody. We learned a lot about pro providing medical care in an innovative way during the pandemic, um, so much so that in fact, I can't imagine going back to the way it was. For us to continue this, though, it's going to require some regulatory and legislative changes. And so by normalizing health equity in, in climate change, um, I think we have a really good chance of continuing all the innovation and the forward movement that we've managed to very quickly put together in the past two years. Um, you know, if, if a person isn't classically one of our patients, uh, it doesn't really matter because the communities that we serve sink or swim together. As, as the saying goes, we're all in the same flood. I think what the Admiral is trying to do and, and her team is get everyone into the same boat. So I'm just very excited. Thank you. And, you know, as, as I was starting to, to reflect in terms of, you know, although we may all be in this boat together, uh, some of those impacts are felt differently. And Mishka, it'd be wonderful to get your perspective, given the focus of your organization. You know, there's as I mentioned, there's, you know, absolutely conversations on how uh, impacts are disproportionate. But I'd love to get behind the stats and the data where you might be able to share to us, what does this really look like? And, you know, what are you seeing on the front lines that, that you'd like to share with others so that we can, we can make this uh, something very real for everybody? Thanks, Seema. And I think you're absolutely right in thinking about how we get behind the stats and the data because, you know, we all have been talking about building a culture of health, and we know that frontline communities are often disproportionately impacted, and that the health impacts of those communities already show it, that they're, you know, disproportionately have impacts like uh, asthma or um, low birth weights or, 
hospitalization. So like the data is already here and, and we know those things. But what does it really mean when we're talking about the impacts of climate um, when it comes to these frontline communities? And you know, for us, and when we think about it, um, for frontline communities, it really means that those inconveniences that those communities already have to bear the brunt of, uh, whether we're talking about environmental injustice impacts from, you know, the histories of these communities um, to the adverse impacts that have been left to their health, um, that those inconveniences become commonplace. And so like when we're thinking about, for instance, in a place like my hometown of Camden, New Jersey, they're on the East Coast where uh, combined sewer flooding has already been commonplace. It means that not only you know, are people thinking about what the impacts are every time it rains, um, but now these storms are more frequent. Um, the flooding is more impactful. Um, and these are communities that generally may not have home insurance in order to be able to um, make repairs after these floods. And so homeowners are worried about the impacts of the mold when they may already have asthma. Um, it means that the you know, urban heat island effect and many of uh, the Black, Indigenous, uh, and other um, uh, communities of color um, are impacted um, by you know, these rising temperatures in these communities. Here in the Northeast, just two weeks ago, we had a heat wave and uh, they were, the local community was giving out box fans to put in people's windows. Um, and you know, that's something that maybe many of the viewers haven't thought about or that their children may have never even seen because they have central air and they're used to being able to just turn a switch and cool their homes down. Um, and so, you know, for these communities that are already disproportionately impacted by, um, you know, the histories of environmental injustice, these climate impacts really do um, impact their ability to be able to live, uh, you know, lives that are going to be able to bring them quality and joy. Um, and so how do we make sure that as we're thinking about this, what we hope is a just, just transition to a green economy, um, that we are ensuring that the BIPOC communities are able to have equitable access to the resources that are coming from the federal uh, funding or from the uh, government and other resources, and that they're also able to participate in the economy itself. So if I could follow up from that, and, and thank you for taking a moment to, to really help illustrate what this looks like. How can HHS, healthcare, and our audience members work with communities to help support and drive real change? Great question. Um, and I would say the number one thing that HHS and other uh, you know, partners, institutions, governments can do um, is to start with talking to the communities themselves um, and begin to be able to co-create those solutions that put the communities at the center of creating what's going to be um, sort of the just solution for, for their communities. Um, equity needs to be at the center. And I was very glad to hear um, Admiral Levine, you know, talk about environmental justice and think about how health equity and that word is really being put at the center of the office um, and the work that they plan to do, um, that it can't be an afterthought as we're putting the plans together. Um, so I would, you know, begin with co-creation. It's going to take collaborative efforts, um, thinking outside the box about how uh, public-private partnerships are able to work together to come up with the solutions um, in order to come up, you know, we haven't gotten into this climate crisis overnight, and it's really going to take all of us working together um, in order to make a difference. Thank you. I, I think that's some very solid, actionable advice. Um, so, you know, Don and Colin, you both come at this from different areas of expertise. I'd really like to understand from both of your perspectives, why are environmental impacts of climate change such an important part of the discussion around health equity? You know, we were building off of what Mishka was saying, health equity really needs to be center. So how does that fit from your perspectives? And, and Colin, we'll start with you this time. Thanks. Great. I think um, it's really important to understand 
that 80% of actual health care occurs outside of the exam room. It's about 20% of, of health care occurs in our clinics. So that means that everything else, social determinants of health, resources or lack of resources, those things that lead to ACEs, adverse childhood events, um, traumas when you're a child, those all impact the health uh, of you at that time, but also for generations forward. If for whatever reason things happen and you don't graduate from high school, you are going to have a shorter life expectancy statistically. It's going to cost four times as much to care for you uh, health-wise over the course of your life as well. So these things really matter. Um, that, As Mishka was saying, the economy and health are absolutely interconnected. Um, if, if there's a, a flood or a fire or a heat wave, there's obviously direct physical effects that we feel. But these events also affect the economy in our communities. If you don't have access to your school because it burned down, or your house burns down, or you don't have a job because the, um, the business got flooded out, that directly impacts the economy of the individual and their ability to fund or not fund certain things is going to affect the health of them and their family. So as uh, global warming destroys our environment, unfortunately, it destroys our economy um, and with that, directly, our health. You're muted, Seema. Thank you, Don. It would be great to get your perspective as well. Thanks. Well, I agree with everything that both uh, Mishka and Colin said. I mean, the, the basics here, we have to be concerned about this because it's important because of the size of the effect. That the World Health Organization has now declared climate change to be the single most significant threat to human health on the planet. The science is pointing us there. And so we, we have to be concerned about this for everyone. But as Mishka pointed out, the effects are unevenly distributed, as are many of the forms uh, of burden and suffering on our planet, unevenly distributed according to wealth and, and uh, socioeconomic background and race in this country. Um, the uh, we should be. We need to put resources where the gains are the most, and the gains are the most among the people most af af affected. This, of course, is in the context of inequity as a global issue in the American healthcare scene. And uh, you can't be interested in quality and health anymore without being interested in equity. The, the, the science doesn't let you escape that issue. Uh, there is another point I'd like to make, though, and this is, it's not zero sum. <clears throat> at the University, at uh, Berkeley, there's uh, Professor John A. Powell, who has uh, written and spoken a lot about what he calls targeted universalism, which is often, if you meet the needs of the people most in need, you end up meeting everyone's needs. And I, and I think framing this as somehow a win-lose situation, where if we help the minorities and disadvantaged populations, we're somehow taking it away from others is, is actually a misconception. Helping mitigate the effects of climate and carbon on people of color and marginalized communities will help us all. You know, I'd, I'd like to build off of that in terms of those impacts. So, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot to be understood, um, although there's a lot of information out there already when it comes to how climate change harms health. You know, for instance, um, many people don't know the fact that heat kills more people than any other extreme weather, uh, than all other extreme weather events combined. Uh, so, Colin, from a physician's perspective, what does you, what do you see firsthand? What are you witnessing? Uh, you know, I know you're in the Northwest and you had uh, some extreme heat events earlier uh, earlier last year. I'd love to know what that really looks like. Yeah, um, you know, I live in Portland. I was born in Vancouver, Canada. 2021 uh, was a horrific heat wave we've not seen before, and it followed the great fire season in, of 2020 in Oregon. The heat wave last year had over 1,400 deaths associated with it, over 100 each in Oregon and Washington, and over 800 in British Columbia. Started as a what meteorologists call a heat dome. Ironically, this is pretty much compared to how a pressure cooker works. Uh, and it sat over the area for several days. Portland, Oregon uh, is known for its rain. People avoid us for that fact. But uh, there was a day on June 28th when my temperature read 116 degrees in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Canada registered 121 degrees, its highest heat ever. So what does this mean? Well, environmentally, um, you know, Mount Rainier lost a third of its snowcap. Uh, 
at what we saw structurally buckled roads, closed bridges, public transportation closes so people couldn't go to work. Uh, fruit was baked on the vines, crops were destroyed in the Northwest, drove up food prices, obviously set off wildfires. Seattle and Portland were particularly poorly able to handle this because these are two of the three cities with the least amount of air conditioners because usually you don't run into 116 degree heat. And a majority of the deaths that occurred in the Northwest occurred in homes without air conditioning. Um, 1,100 people were hospitalized because of the heat in Oregon and Washington. And when you get that kind of overload, the EMS system is overloaded and waits for non-heat related or for, for any related medical condition increased. So the strain on the resources affected people with other conditions like heart attacks, for instance. Um, how this affected people differently. If you had resources, as Mishka was saying, yet you have an air conditioner. And if you don't have an air conditioner and you have resources, you go to the hotel. A great majority of the hotel rooms were booked in Portland uh, when there would usually be much less than that booked. And then there are those that don't have access to air conditioning and actually have to continue to work. And a, a, a survey of Washington farm workers showed that two fifths had no access to shade and a quarter had no access to cool water while they were working. A death of a farm worker in St. Paul, Oregon, uh, Sebastian Francisco Perez, led to a huge outrage and a lot of intense and appropriate scrutiny on, on how we were treating people that worked outside. But don't forget, this followed the fire season of 2020 as we were heading into a pandemic. And you talk about the same populations being subject to economic justice as to climate justice. Um, we look at the health justice and you know, a thousand, uh, a million acres in Oregon were destroyed, 11 people killed, thousands of homes destroyed, 40,000 people were evacuated, 500,000 people were in evacuation zones, including our hospital. It didn't have to get evacuated, but it came really close, and entire towns were destroyed in Oregon. Phoenix, Talent, Detroit, Gates, these are not wealthy places. And so when those towns were literally destroyed, we now have, at the beginning of a pandemic with no vaccination, uh, these people that had to be housed in um, large uh, centers, shelters, in the middle of a pandemic. You talk about uh, insult on injury. Um, so, so we really are amplifying the haves and the have-nots. And as Don was saying, um, this affects everybody. So we really need to make sure that our resources get to those that need it, and that we listen, as Mishka was saying, to what people need and what they want. So Colin, everything you shared it's a lot. It's very real. It's very now. I'd love to understand from your perspective, what can physicians, nurses, and others do to help prevent some of these impacts? How do we make a difference? Yeah, there's basically three ways. Innovate, anticipate, and educate. To innovate, we need to lead on issues of waste and awareness. Uh, we started a simple policy, wait, don't waste. That means surgeons can't open single-use surgical instruments unless they actually need it. Uh, and has saved a lot of money. Standardizing trays. There's a lot of things that can be done. Um, Healthcare Without Harm does a great job of helping to educate physicians and hospitals on this. Find ways to reduce emissions while maintaining or improving outcomes. The great anesthesia department at Kaiser Permanente Northwest several years ago stopped using um, desfluorine and switched over to sevofluorine. And for our 600,000 plus members every year, that saves the equivalent of 1,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent being uh, released into the air. Anticipate. Despite our intentions and efforts, we will be providing care in a climate changed world. Part of our mission, uh, you can't, we can't meet our mission if we can't do that. So we have to anticipate what we will need to provide ongoing care to our patients when there are supply chain disruptions, road closures, remember we had buckling roads and 116 degree heat, mass evacuations up to and including our hospitals. If you don't have a plan, you need to get one now. You can't wait for it to happen because it's way too late and it happens way too fast. And finally, educate our patients and our colleagues listen to us. We need to make sure that we're asking them about what resources they have, do they have a plan if they need to evacuate and make sure they know what to do when the air quality gets bad or heat becomes a major issue um, and so that they can take care of themselves and in other areas of the country, flooding and mosquito-borne diseases. So innovate, anticipate, and educate. Thanks. I, I appreciate keeping it really simple in terms of where we can focus. So Don, turning to you for a moment, 
Uh, you come with a deep background and uh, working with IHI and the quality movement. I'd really like to understand, you know, how how is this work being embedded into the quality movement, and where do you see see those links? Very strong links. Um, first, what is the nature of quality itself? Quality, the simplest definition of quality I know is meeting the need. You decide what you'd like to help with, and then where that need is, that's where you go. Back in the turning points of the quality movement, say the National Academy of Medicine report crossing the quality chasm in 2001, we didn't actually have climate and the, the environmental threats we're talking about now on the screen. The needs we were talking about were still are here for patient safety, for patient-centered care in organizations, for following the science when we give patients medicines and surgery. But now that we understand so much more about where the burden of illness is coming from, then meeting then quality means doing something about it. So equity now has also come to the foreground. And of course, those overlap, as we've talked about. Um, excellence isn't divisible. And if you want to be excellent in the care we give, we have to, go, we have to be excellent in meeting the, the causes of, of distress. And that now includes climate change, as we've heard. Um, I think there's a more direct connection because some of the basic tenets of modern quality, like for example, that higher quality costs less, that you actually focus on reduction of waste, reduction of what's unnecessary as part of the quality agenda, as Colin was just saving, is absolutely part of both the quality movement and environmental stewardship. Uh, we have tremendous evidence of overuse of care that doesn't help people, for example. And that idea of making care focus on all and only what the patient needs and exactly what matters to people, that's a carbon reducing idea. Um, the, uh, the idea of, that uh, Professor Bernard Lown uh, spoke about for decades of his work about focusing on what really matters uh, with lower carbon footprints. So there's a very close relationship. And in the methodologies, quality improvement uses metrics well, uh, encourages constant testing and cycling through plan, do, study, act cycles. It includes uh, vast amounts of cooperation across boundaries so that we can track the system. Um, all of these attributes of the modern quality movement, they absolutely apply here. We need to learn our way together through quality improvement to reduction of, uh, of uh, the carbon footprint and greenhouse gases. So I see this as absolutely central and uh, a proper evolution of our attention. And yes, you're right. The uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, the organization that I had the privilege of leading years ago and now I'm a senior fellow at, is thoroughly devoted to this now as part of its agenda. So building off of that, one question I'd like to add is, uh, you know, how, how do we go from that learning point to understanding um, that emissions are just as harmful to a patient's health as are medical errors. Uh, you've made a great strong case of, of the why. Um, we, I, I think that's where leadership like uh, like Kaiser Permanente is showing and, and uh, Dr. Cave and Mishka really matters. We need people with gravitas and respect and, uh, and, a, and uh, trust in the public to be bringing this message forward, not hectoring or lecturing or yelling, but saying, look, this is the truth, and we need to defend the truth right now at a time in our country when sometimes science is under, is under siege. But if we follow the science and we as professionals speak about what we now understand about the causal relationships here to both equity and health outcomes and climate, uh, we will be trusted. So we, it's not a time for silence. Uh, it's a time to speak up for the truth. So... Moving to that speaking up for the truth piece, uh, I'd like to ask one last question of all of you, and you have all brought such amazing perspectives. You know, as we, as we are focusing on this key issue of equity, what are your thoughts on how we can further advance health, making that connection between health equity and reducing greenhouse gas emissions? These are two very important elements. Of, of what lies ahead for us. And, and I'd love to get each of your perspectives on how we connect them together. And um, Mishka, I'd love to start with you, please. Sure, thank you. Um, and, you know, at first I would say, I think, you know, having uh, venues and opportunities to have this, these kinds of discussions are a great start. And I am very encouraged by 
the commitment of Kaiser Permanente and thinking about what the change at Health and Human Services in these new departments will mean, um, because both of those institutions, I feel like really have been great at thinking about health um, at both an individual scale and a community scale. And I think that that is what's going to be needed as we're thinking about um, tackling uh, health equity and greenhouse gas emissions. When we're thinking about frontline communities, um, you know, we understand that those communities, that the individuals in those communities are often less resources, but the communities themselves are often also less resourced. And so, you know, being able to provide the resources and technical assistance that the communities need in order to be able to access resources to begin to have these conversations to tackle their own greenhouse gas emissions and to provide services to their uh, citizens, um, we need to be able to think about the solutions on both of those scales. And I think these discussions really are the first step to being able to tackle that. Thank you. Uh, Don, love to get your perspectives as well. Uh, we need to lean in and get action. So some of the things that really matter, uh, first, as Mishka uh, said several times, the voice of the marginalized and affected communities needs to be elevated. We need to make sure that people have power. This is about a transfer of power uh, toward people who have been denied power and, and whose needs have been um, uh, neglected far too much. So voices for communities. Second, voices for youth. I am now convinced that the uh, political and uh, social energy we may need to get this job done uh, may be more in the hands of young people than ever before. Young people, it's their futures we're talking about. And I sense a willingness. And if we can reach out across generational boundaries and help youth mobilize, that'll be positive. A third would be, uh, begin it would be data that matters in understanding these textured differences. We need to stratif stratify our metrics so as we measure greenhouse gases and the effects of uh, pollution, uh, we, we, we need to be able to look at, at communities that are specially affected. We just had a meeting this morning with the Washington State Medicaid uh, people who have a climate watch program uh, that they're starting, which will allow a very fine grained view of effects. That's going to matter. Finally, and maybe a little bit edgily, we got to demand authenticity here. Uh, greenwashing won't help. Uh, and we need to hold ourselves to account for actually changing emissions, actually getting to the answer. Nature will know if we are greenwashing and nature will be unforgiving. And so there's a level of discipline here attached to metrics and goals that we really think, I think is a very important part of the commitments we need to make. Thanks for the chance to speak with you soon. Thank you, Don. And, and I really, uh, that's gonna stay with me. Nature will know. Um, so, Colin, I'd love for you to, to leave us with your thoughts uh, on, on uh, and to wrap up this conversation. Absolutely. I think you're going to see a common theme here. This is all about paying attention. Uh, we can't have arrogance. For years and years and years, the medical community has been just arrogant. Now we need to listen to those communities who are in need to get them what they say they need, not what we tell them they need or we think they need. Again, this is a common message I think all three of your panelists have said today. Um, and you know, if you look at what happens if a hotel needs workers, but those workers can't afford to live in the area of the hotel and they have to live 30 minutes away and drive in, then you know, we are driving up emissions by making them drive into work. Affordable housing is key. If a child has an asthma flare and his mother or father who's working in the fields has to give up that day to take them in because it's a, a bad air quality day and they have to go to the ER, that family loses that day of pay, that worsens an already poor economic situation and we get into those cycles that we talked about before. Second, we need to ensure that how we practice medicine is done in a way that reduces our emissions. We talked about a couple of examples at the very beginning um, I, I actually, the, uh, the Admiral mentioned that the U.S. healthcare industry is responsible for 8.5% of the admissions in this country. We, as physicians and clinicians uh, and healthcare professionals, have to lead by caring what we do, caring about what we order, and making sure that we understand the impact of every order that we make. 
And again, a great place to start in understanding the link is realizing that even with our best intentions and all the money that we have in technology, only 20% of a person's healthcare is decided on what happens in that clinic. We really have to go outside our clinic walls. We have to go upstream. We have to go into the communities and understand um, that uh, a person's health is influenced by so much more than us as healthcare professionals if all we're doing is the healthcare. So we as healthcare professionals have to get out, make our voices louder, um, be honest, as Don says, hold us ourselves accountable, but hold others accountable uh, to make sure that um, we can make sure people have access to having a home and being in school and having options in case of climate disaster, and that we'll be able to continue to perform our mission of caring for our communities um, in a climate changed world while doing our best to mitigate how much climate change there is. I've really enjoyed it today. I really appreciate my, my other two panelists and thank you for having me, Seema. Thank you. What an amazing discussion. So many great themes, so many lessons and thoughts to carry forward. And while this might be the end of today's conversation, it absolutely is not the end of the discussion. This is the first in a Kaiser Permanente's discussion series about, in, about getting to net zero and how the health sector can move the needle on climate change and the health of the communities we serve. Um, I, I really appreciate the authenticity and the different viewpoints that all of our panelists brought. Um, also very delighted to have, had the, uh, to have had Admiral Levine share with us along with Dr. Uh, Shukher. And not only thanking you for your time today, but also really wanted to thank everybody for the important work and for using your voice to make a difference. Of course, also thank you to everybody who tuned in today. We are so thrilled to bring this conversation to you. Thank you. Thank you.